Hello everyone, we're just going to get started today. Uh, thank you for joining us. I really, 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 really wish we could all be here uh, in person, but unfortunately uh, we're not able to be. <laughs> so that makes me sad, but hopefully next year we can all make some friends from uh, maybe this workshop that we do today. Last year I made a friend, uh, and that friend's name is James. And James is joining us Ooh. here today to help us uh, te basically show off a year's worth of research into Wi-Fi hacking with microcontrollers. So James, thank you for jumping in and doing this presentation today. No problem, thanks for having me. Yeah, so James, uh, C3 was your first conference, and that's where we met. Uh, can you, for anybody who might be uh, I guess, virtually attending C3 for the first time. Explain what C3 is and why uh, it's kind of worth going to when times are permitting. A bunch of weird people get together, <laughs> drink, some, <laughs> drink some Club Mata. You get to meet some other weird people, see what all the weird people have done for the past year. Scooters. It's a lot of fun. Art. Scooters, too. And strange people, very strange people. Vacuum tubes. Um, people <laughs> send messages to each other in like giant vacuum tubes, like strung like across the roof. Uh, if you're a hacker space, or even if you're just a, a group of hackers, you can get your own table and kind of show off all the projects you've done. Yeah, it was very different from DEF CON, which I'm used to and is much more structured because DEF CON is all about like, you know, centered around interests where if you're into Wi Fi hacking or a specific kind of hacking, you can kind of go over to that village and uh, find everything to do with Wi-Fi hacking, but you have to like work within that framework. At C3, it's more about you know groups that have gotten together to create really interesting and cool projects. And the group we were with made a really awesome badge that I got to kind of participate in the uh, launch of, where it was interactive and like everybody got to uh, kind of get a badge and play with it and uh, be part of a community. So I really like C3. Oh yeah, the Bill badge. Thank you. Yes. Badge, yeah. So the bill badge uh, uses like an infrared transmitter to be able to change other badges to the same color that the current the badge is currently at. So people thought it was a game where you ran around and tried to make everyone's badges be their team's color. But in fact, it was there was a secret game embedded inside it where if you went around and changed your badge into every color, then it would unlock a special rainbow mode and it would like make this disco effect and you could make other badges glitch out and go crazy too. So it was a really cool, uh, really interesting way of getting to know tons of people at the conference. So uh, I got to do my first talk there, which I organized, wrote the slides for uh, in the middle of the night and then got maybe three hours of sleep before doing but a lot of people attended and it was super cool and I really really enjoyed it so I'm really happy to be back and I'm excited to get to talk to some of you so please if you're in the chat speak up ask questions introduce yourself say hello we do this because we really like meeting new people and the C3 conference is a great way to do that so uh, yeah hopefully you guys will find this useful and if you want to dive deeper into this um, <clears throat> we've done a ton of research this year, so we're going to throw a lot of information out there. And we do have a Udemy class that we produced that goes into extensive detail. It has labs and basically is like a lot more content than we can go through in the time slot that we have today. So if you want to check that out, you can go to hack.gay and all of the Udemy uh, classes that we've done are there. We also did a really cool one on creating a um, like a bad USB device with a DigiSpark. We're kind of been uh, focusing on just how to hack with the lowest cost possible device. And that kind of leads us nicely into our topic today. The ESP8266 is a really great way to get started with Wi-Fi hacking because unlike a wireless network adapter, you can find these things for super cheap on AliExpress or Amazon. You can buy, like me, a hundred of them if you really get into this. So if you fry one, two, five, or whatever, then it's not that big of a deal if you let out the magic smoke and suddenly, you know, you're back from scratch. If you do that with an Alpha wireless card, you know, you could be out like 40, 50, 60 bucks um, for just like a low end one. Whereas these, you can really fry as many as you want and it's not that big of a deal. Um, also, James has been nice enough to participate in making this project super easy for people to use. So on a high level, James, can you explain uh, kind of what the Hunator is and why it's helpful for using devices like this? So the Hunator is a tool for interacting with the ESP8266 the author over serial and it's made to be super easy to use and it's cross-platform. So it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's not a complicated piece of software, but it's really helpful. 
So you're just getting into this sort of stuff. Right. So before, kind of the barrier to entry with this is how do you get this little microcontroller to plug into any computer or any device and actually you know, have it work? It used to be a really complicated process where people would have to use a serial monitor, and it was always a different serial monitor depending on what computer you were using. So if you were using a Mac OS computer versus a Windows computer, it was a totally different process. So James uh, knows a bit of Rust and was actually able to create a cross-platform way of doing this. So now I can reliably say that if you, no matter what kind of computer you have, unless it's something really, really weird, it should be relatively easy to just plug one of these things in and just get it to work. That's different than last year. The last time I did this presentation, there were a lot of steps to get started. So I think that this is a huge advancement in making this tool useful for everybody. So I just want to say thank you to James because this is an open source project. He did it for free. And these are the kinds of contributions that make this sort of stuff more accessible for anybody that wants to try this out, learn about Wi-Fi hacking and um, get into this. Maybe if they don't have, you know, $60 to experiment with something and possibly fry this board. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, we're going to go through some stuff today that would only be possible for most people um, if it's as simple as possible to get started and very, very reliable. And I think that James has managed to do that with the Hunator. So um, I'm gonna go over and, oh, actually before I do that, I wanna show off one more thing. <clears throat> so this crazy setup is a culmination of about a year's worth of research into getting the ESP8266 microcontroller to hack uh, effectively. And I know this is kind of dark, but this is a directional Wi-Fi antenna that allows me to do something I've been demanding that uh, Spacehoon incorporate for a long time, which is fox hunting. So what I can actually do is I can determine the source of a signal by just standing here and going around like this and identifying exactly where a device is. This could be a network, like a rogue access point, or it could be someone's cell phone if I really want to be able to track them that way. So this is a really cool advancement uh, because just the, the cheap little ESP8266 module in a D1 Mini or something, you technically, can, uh, you technically can use this, but you need to walk around and kind of like do fox hunting by looking at where the signal strength is going up or down. Over the last year, I convinced Stefan to develop a signal hunting or RSSI feature that allows us to lock onto a single uh, device and be able to see whether the signal is getting stronger or weaker. So for a regular module, that means I can walk around and try to identify when I'm getting hot or cold. But for a directional antenna, if I can attach one to the ESP8266, I can just sit in place, sweep this back and forth and find out where a signal is. Now, there's a lot of applications for this. Let's say that I, I am far away from a source of a Wi-Fi signal and I want to identify the best place to put a directional antenna so I can boost my signal. Maybe I'm borrowing Wi-Fi from the neighbors, not that that would ever happen. But if you were, then this might be a way to identify the best place to get that signal. There's also a lot of applications when it comes to somebody maybe borrowing your Wi-Fi. If you want to figure out which neighbor has hopped onto your Wi-Fi network, you can basically figure out exactly who that is by walking around and uh, figuring out from which wall the device is connecting to your Wi-Fi network. So kind of a, a cat and mouse game here when it comes to all the things you can do with this setup, but this is all made possible to a couple people. Um, one of them uh, is in the chat and that's uh, Brix. So Brix uh, is responsible for helping develop the uh, Andromeda deauthor board, which we are going to be demonstrating today. So also a shout out to him for making some really awesome hardware that makes it possible to do some stuff that just wasn't really possible to reliably do on this before. Now, there uh, was an advanced deauthor, or a, a deauthor D1 Mini Pro, I think is what it was called, um, that has the ability to plug an antenna into it, but you also have to solder a zero ohm resistor in order to get it to work. So I found that to be a very burdensome process and really, really not very well, uh, not very fun to do. So. Um, I did that a couple times and I either blew the little tiny ohm resistor off with like the heat gun or I uh, got it stuck to the uh, soldering iron and then I wasn't able to get it off. So it was really difficult to do and I think that for uh, a small price you can support the team that's done this research and pick up one of these um, Andromeda deauthor boards that allows you to actually do the directional antenna stuff as well as put on really whatever kind of like high gain antenna you want. 
And I've seen some people do some pretty crazy stuff to stick a directional antenna on like a Node MCU or a D1 Mini. This is like a very sane and easy way to do that if you're interested in Wi-Fi security research. So if you're interested in that stuff, you can go to, uh, if you're in the EU, spacehoon.store, or if you're in the United States, you can go to hack.gay and pick one up. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the presentation and we'll get started with that. <clears throat> cool, so um, this is an update to the presentation that I did and the workshop that I did last year. And in this case, I have to assume that um, I can't sell you D1 minis. So last year, I was just giving out D1 minis uh, to anybody that came to the presentation and people were like, I think it was like giving me like five euro or stuff like per, per D1 mini. This year, I can't do that. But if you want to support the team, as I said, you can always go and pick one up. Um, but I've adapted this a little bit to more kind of explore and demonstrate to you what's possible with this hardware and why it's so interesting and cool and why if you're interested in Wi-Fi hacking, this is probably the best way to get started with it, uh, especially if you don't have access to a Linux computer or if you wanna be able to do this in a cross-platform way. And just a, a quick example, I have a Mac OS computer. It is not good for Wi-Fi hacking. I can't do packet injection stuff. It, it's very annoying to try to do anything hacking related, but by plugging this in, I can capture handshakes with uh, the internal card of this computer so I can do things like uh, you know traditional Wi-Fi password cracking very, very easily by just adding this. I don't need to use a virtual machine. I don't use to, need to use like a wireless network adapter. And it's really cool to be able to do that. <clears throat> All right, so again, for anybody just joining us, I was also kind of trying to stall a little bit so more people could join the chat and it looks like people have. So welcome everyone who's gonna be in the workshop today. Um, welcome to our virtual class at, at uh, Remote C3. Um, I guess it would have been like 37C3, right? Yep, but sadly, it's just the first remote C3. So uh, Next year. Next year, yeah. So this is how James and I met, and I'm really excited to be able to do another conference here in collaboration with Mitch and the other people at the Hardware Hacking um, Group Center, Village, Organization, whatever they want to call it, area, because uh, it's not really an area uh, this time. But uh, we learned a lot from them last year. And the, the main thing we learned was if you want to do something, if you want to teach people, just jump in. So last year, we made a bunch of really, really tacky uh, posters in the middle of the night and plastered them all over every single wall and door coming into the, the area we were holding the workshop. And after we printed like seriously like 60 of them and just put them everywhere, um, enough people saw the, the really alarming looking like fake German um, like wording on it that I think it was like Wi-Fi microcontroller breaker something. Uh, and it attracted enough people, oh, oops, it attracted enough people that we were able to get a pretty good crowd. So I got to meet a lot of really cool people and they came back to our table where we were doing the bill badge and got to learn about that too. So I found it to be a great way to meet people. So if you're ever going to a hacker conference and you have the opportunity to share something you know or teach or anything, I highly recommend it because it lets you not just be one of the spectators, but also just get to know other people that like the same stuff. And it's not that hard. I remember I was drinking a lot of, um, oh my God, Mata. Uh, while I was there and I was so jacked up. I was like kind of like twitching a little bit because I'd been drinking it all night while I was preparing the slides. So I was very, very nervous to do my first presentation, but you know, it feels a lot less uh, nerve wracking remotely. But either way, it's a really good way to just get in touch with other people that like hacking. So if you like this presentation, please reach out after, um, say hello on Twitter. There's lots of other stuff that we do and it's great to meet other people at C3 and just on the internet at large that like hacking and uh, are part of the hacking community. So uh, who are we? Well, my name is Cody. I'm a security researcher at Veronis. Um, I have an interest in Wi-Fi hacking. I really also like finding the lowest cost way of being able to hack Wi-Fi. So I'm interested in, for example, using like Raspberry Pis and uh, these little microcontrollers to do Wi-Fi hacking stuff. Um, I'm also the host and creator of the Nullbyte YouTube channel. Uh, the Hacking with Friends live stream, which I currently do twice a week. So if you want to check that out, it is on the Security Forward YouTube channel. And, uh, or you can go to hackingwithfriends.com. 
And I also produce episodes on Hack 5, one of which just dropped today. So if you want to check that out, we just released an episode on Wi-Fi hacking tools where we went around the last, well, one of the last in-person hacking conferences that we went to and asked different hackers there what their favorite Wi-Fi hacking tools are. So if you want to follow up with some other Wi-Fi hacking stuff that is not microcontroller related, you can go ahead and check that out because it was a really interesting conversation with a bunch of really great cool hackers. Oh yeah, and you can always follow me um, on my Twitter at Cody Kinsey. My GitHub is uh, Skikar, and my Mastodon is also Skika. And then uh, James, take it away. So I'm James. Uh, I didn't write that second bullet point, but that goes along with the kind of imposed identity of Howdy Burgers that's been placed on me by Cody over the past year. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm a computer science student and software engineer. So that's what I do kind of most of the time. But in my spare time, I try my best to pretend to be a hacker. And I do some open source stuff like the Hunator. And at C3, I mostly mess around with the Pixel Flute. You, and, I'm sorry, uh, you own the Pixel Flute thoroughly. Not quiet, but <laughs> <laughs> every time I looked Hopefully up, you, one day. every time I looked up, you were representing us somewhere on it. So I was very proud. Of it. And for anybody who doesn't know what that is, can you explain what that, what that was? So it, it, in like a physical C3, it's the um, there's a projector pointed at a pointed at a wall, and it's hooked up to a server that you open a TCP connection with, it, and you send a pixel coordinate and the the color for the pixel. So you try to form images like that, but everybody's fighting you to try and form images as well. So you have to send the pixels as fast as you possibly can and as many times as you possibly can. So it's a uh, pretty competitive, but a lot of fun. There's actually a virtual one this year, which I've started playing around with a little bit. So. That's excellent. I remember it was uh, you were directing so much traffic at it that they started like banning IPs and like limiting it, and you really had to start getting creative with like how you were able to take I, that over. <laughs> I don't know that was me. I hope that wasn't me. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's no evidence it was you, but yes, not, not saying it was me. But yeah, it was really yeah. cool to uh, to also see you get to like get involved with the rest of the group and just become part of the hacking community. Because before, um, also for anybody who wants to know the origin of this nickname, um, James finally like uh, you know had never been to a hacker conference before. Like all these like weird strong personality people were like like bossing him around and like trying to show him this like big ass conference. And then um, he finally like let his guard down and like told us a story about how like moving from Texas and like some like mean British kids like called him Howdy Burgers. And that was the nickname <laughs> that we proceeded to call him for the rest of the year. So it was just a nice bonding moment where, you know, one person shares like a personal story and the rest of the hackers are like, that's your nickname. Uh, where, uh, yeah, that happened to me at DEF CON and um, at many of my other jobs. I'll share that uh, when I first worked in security, my nickname was Hot Pants because I once attended an entire meeting when a can of pepper spray exploded in my pants. So you never know how you're going to get a nickname, but you just know when it sticks. Very nice. All right. So... This is a question we have to go over at the beginning and we'll probably touch on several times. Uh, is this legal and can I get in trouble? So we almost didn't get to do this conference or this workshop at the last conference because somebody at a previous conference had covered deauthing and basically not done this warning enough or not made it serious enough. And whoever had attended the workshop just went off and started deauthing everything at the conference. So it caused lots of problems with <clears throat> all these like art displays and other things people had worked really hard on. So they took a very negative view to deauthing because of all the disruption it can cause, even in the hacker community. So uh, in virtually every country, it is illegal and a crime to attack a network that you do not have permission to test. So James, can you give an example of something that would be illegal to use the deauthor to do? Going to school, <laughs> kicking all the devices off the school network. That would do it. Thing. That would do it. Um, you know, interfering with uh, the school's ability to provide education to a bunch of kids would probably get you in a lot of trouble kicking devices randomly off of networks and then accidentally kicking a medical device or a monitor or something else that never ever should be disconnected could also be something that you could do that would get you in trouble. And we have to point out that you never know what a network is connected to. There are so many stories that I cannot share with you that involve finding a network that is uh, vulnerable when I'm working with a client or somebody else and then getting into that network and finding out it's connected to something absolutely critical and just being horrified that it's been left open or exposed or is using like an old type of encryption. So, you know, you never know what's going to be connected to a traffic light 
or like some other like thing that like absolutely cannot be messed up. So you really need to be careful when you're learning these techniques because just joining random networks or brute forcing random networks or attacking random networks is not always legal. You need to be doing this against appropriate targets. And one of our goals for the next year is going to be developing as many safe targets to hack against as possible. We already have a couple of examples of this on my GitHub, uh, but there are lots of different ways you can set up a network that is perfectly legal and safe to hack. And one of them is just, just to use your phone to create a hotspot. Um, otherwise, you can use your own Wi-Fi network, but if you are going to be kicking other people in your home or in your office off of the network, then you really need to let them know and get permission to do that. Otherwise, you can get in trouble. So we need to be very clear about all that. And if you go ahead and do all this stuff anyway, you go against all these warnings, you could get in a lot of trouble up to being arrested if you attack the wrong thing, because this attack is very, very easy to spot. It's very loud. And based on just the signal hunting techniques that I demonstrated, having this directional antenna and moving it around, it would not be difficult for somebody to find out who is responsible for these attacks. So just with all that in mind, these are not stealthy attacks and they're illegal to do against a network or a device that you don't have permission to. James, anything else to add? You, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. It's the reason a lot of people ask, just to preempt this, a lot of people ask, why is there no deauth all button? This is sort of why, mostly. It's so that you don't fall into this sort of trap. It's partially implemented by design, but you absolutely, you, it, you'd struggle to accidentally deauth a network that you weren't trying to. So exactly, there aren't a lot of excuses for you. Yeah, so this tool was was designed to basically be very precise and make it possible to do this legally and safely. So unlike some other tools that might allow you to just attack everything at range, this will not allow you to do that. You need to specify the target or targets manually. And that's something that is done to protect you legally from just going after something and attacking something by accident that might be sensitive or protected. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, this is very meta. It's a, a YouTube video within a YouTube video. Oh my gosh, wait, am I playing K-pop? No, I muted it, good. Okay, so this is a quick demonstration of what it looks like to use the new Hunator interface in order to access the uh, the new V3 dauthor. So one big difference is this is all command line stuff. It's quite small, I know, but we're going to see it in person. I just want to give you guys a quick impression of what this actually looks like so that you can see what, uh, you know, what this looks like when you're scanning. So here, this is what it looks like to just plug in the tool, run Hunator, do a scan and start identifying devices and networks around you. It's dead simple. And the key difference between the version that I presented last time and this version is that there is no web interface. Now, James, can you explain why we got rid of the web interface and why, um, you know, having a single Wi-Fi, oh, it's not on here, having a single Wi-Fi radio uh, makes it difficult to have a web interface? So, if you have a web interface as with this chip um, and you only have one Wi-Fi chip, I'm sorry, you have to constantly switch between sending packets and kind of hosting the web server. You can't do both at the same time. So that adds a layer of complexity and inefficiency. So if you're just using the serial interface, everything can be a lot more seamless. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, we tried to make this really, really easy for people to use. Uh, and Stefan built this with a web interface so anybody can connect with any device and use the interface. But it, we also really limited what we can do with this chip because if it's constantly having to serve up a web interface, it can't do some really cool stuff like Wi-Fi phishing. So, you know, Wi-Fi phishing is a way that you can get the password by tricking someone into thinking that their router is like restarting or that they need to enter their Wi-Fi password. And we can't host a malicious access point <clears throat> while simultaneously hosting a web interface. We, there's just... There's only one, you know, Wi-Fi radio. So we had to eliminate the Wi-Fi interface, but that gave us the ability with uh, the Hunator, of course, uh, to use a cross-platform cross command line interface to do a lot more powerful stuff. So with this, we can do uh, defeating MAC address randomization. We can figure out, even for devices that are trying to switch around their MAC address to hide uh, and prevent tracking, we can figure out what their real MAC address is, and we can also figure out which networks they've joined in the past. We can fox hunt devices, so we can find the location of devices that are near us. We can uh, capture stations with evil access points. So we can kick a device off of a safe network and force it to join an evil network. We can uh, track and identify targets. So we can basically 
watch for devices and see when they come into range and when they leave range of uh, the range to tell when someone's home or when someone's not home. Um, we've also, as I, I mentioned, developed the cross-platform uh, way of interacting with this device. James also was nice enough to give us the ability to load scripts. So that means that we can actually load a script of pre-programmed things we want to do into the Hunator, um, and that will allow us to play back commands or run like a very long command without needing to uh, actually type it all out. So for anybody that's looking to get into the advanced side of this, I think it's super, super cool that we can you know, share different uh, commands and just run them as a, uh, as a text file. So all this, of course, is done on an ESP8266, and all of this is open source. So if you want to hack around on this, you maybe know some stuff about uh, microcontrollers, about C++, about Arduino, then this is a project that you can take off on, fork, do stuff with, because lots of people can have contributed to it and made it better. <clears throat> so all this is possible due to our good friend, Stefan, um, who... Uh, unfortunately is not able to be here today because he was bitten by a snake. But fortunately it was not, not a venomous snake, it was just a small regular snake, so thankfully he's fine, he just, you know, is, is very shook up by the snake bite. So he's, uh, Stefan is fine, but um, this is a project that was made by his interest in getting the ESP8266 to do some tricks that it normally could not do. Now before, uh, the maker of this chip tried to make it so that you couldn't program in certain bad behavior, but due to Stefan's obsession with uh, trying to get this to do stuff it wasn't supposed to do, he found out that an old version of the STK allowed you to manually write what, whatever packets you want. So by using this older STK, he was able to go back and manually write deauth packets, which is kind of crazy, and then send them and get around this restriction from uh, the manufacturer. So originally, if you just wanted to do this, it was not possible because the newest version of this does not allow you to even write custom packets. It's very locked in in terms of what you can send. But Stefan was able to find out how to send any unencrypted packet, which means beacon frames, uh, which advertise a network as being there. This means that we can create deauthentication frames, which will kick a device off the network, and disassociation frames that have a very similar property. Um, <clears throat> All this means that we have complete control over the wireless radio here, and our only restriction is we can't send encrypted packets. And that means we can't do things like um, Wi-Fi ARP spoofing or some of the other like really like sexy, cool attacks I wish we could do, but we're restricted from doing because of the restrictions the manufacturer put in place. We just haven't found a good way to be able to encrypt packets for a Wi-Fi network um, and then send them on a network to do things like ARP spoofing, which is very sad, but again, it's pretty remarkable that Stefan was even able to uh, find this old SDK and reverse engineer it enough to be able to do this. So what's new since last year? Well, we have the powerful new command line interface. We have, of course, the Hunator. We have more attack options uh, to, to basically go after specific devices or networks. So one thing I really wanted to build into this, and I spoke to Stefan about, is making it easy to find maybe a suspicious device or a target device and do a lot of things uh, to monitor it or, or find out information about it. Basically, how much information can I, I pull out of this phone using Wi-Fi signals? So we also wanted to add some scripting. So that allows people who are interested in this to share scripts and find things that might exploit certain properties of Wi-Fi, or in my case, uh, just lists of Wi-Fi networks that are very common in a certain area that you can pop up in order to find out if a device nearby has ever joined one of those networks before. So we also built in fox hunting to make it possible to locate a device by signal strength and also a demo mode so that I can do this without exposing my MAC address and forcing our uh, production assistant, uh, Michael, to blur all that stuff out and occasionally forget it and then have people send me Twitter messages telling me what my address is. All right, so one thing we got rid of is, see all this, this beautiful web interface? You see how pretty this is? It's gone, forget about it. It wasn't good anyway. Just kidding. It's actually great. So if you have, uh, you know, if you just have like the Wi-Fi deauthor watch or something like that, the V2 is still a really great way of doing a lot of Wi-Fi hacking stuff. But if you want to actually, you know, do some of the more advanced stuff like Wi-Fi phishing or some of the other stuff we've shown off today, you really should use the V3, which is command line only. 
So unfortunately the V2 uh, does have this web interface, but the V3 does not. So uh, the ESP8266 also can create an access point and host a website, which is really pretty cool because we can use this for phishing. Um, it's also super easy to start. Um, not everything in the V2 can be done that we're covering today. So if you're confused about this, you're probably running the old version. And uh, yeah, the, the conclusion about the V2 was that it was not as powerful. So we wanted to switch over to a new version. Uh, and that's kind of the main differences from the V2. So we're gonna go through a very, very quick installation overview. And the first step is to install the Hunator. So James, would you mind walking people through the very, very simple installation process of the Hunator? And you don't have to go through every, you know, every operating system. You can just kind of show people where they can find the information to install it. Let's switch over to James' sure. screen. And I'll also answer some uh, questions in the chat if there are any. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's been some trouble, it looks like. Uh-oh. Uh, but um, yeah, so if you go to hunator.com, H-U-H-N-I-T-O-R.com, uh, you go and you get this nice page that Stefan set up. And um, this is kind of the basic documentation, but you can click on view on GitHub and it'll bring you to the repository. So on the right hand, you have your releases, which are for Linux, Mac and Windows. So just for Windows, I can click that. We'll download, I save the file. Open it, and Windows is angry, but there we go. So that, that works, and you can add it to your path if you want to run it from command line and such. And installation instructions for other operating systems are all in the documentation, so it's pretty simple on every operating system. Oh, so one thing I mentioned, I'm going to mention is um, we've run into this problem before with, a, uh, with our YouTube link being private. Um, so we're playing this through um, the official um, like uh, C3 chat in Big Blue Button. But in the end, we're going to make this public. But if we do that now, it will break the stream and cause further chaos. We have done this before at the Hope Conference. So we're going to, for now, we're going to keep this just through here. But if you want to be able to uh, check this out later, then um, you can go ahead and uh, just look out on Twitter for the link and I'll make sure that it's shared there and we'll make this uh, video public so that you guys can see it. It's currently unlisted, but yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. So the installation process for the Hunator is very, very basic and it's not something that you really need to worry about um, no matter what operating system you're on because it's been syndicated through a bunch of different uh, package managers that make it really easy to install. Um, James, is it on Brew, for example? Yeah, so you can install it on, I think, uh, I think it works on Linux, Brew works on Linux, but um, so you can install it on Homebrew for Linux and Mac. It's oh, can, also... you, uh, can you enlarge the screen a little bit so people can see it? It's a little bit small. Yeah, sure. Yeah, cool. Is that better? Much better. So it's, it's also on um, Snap for most Linux distributions. And if you're on Arch, it's on the Arch user repository. So lot, lots of options. Or you can just compile it yourself. It's uh, up to you. But the instructions are all here. So Awesome. Oh, wow. I, uh, I wasn't looking at the chat for a minute. We have 178 people in the chat now, so that's great. When we started, uh, we just like have been plowing through this, and when we started, we were at like um, four. <laughs> so, we were like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. So, um, sorry, James. Is there anything else you want to um, show about Hunator installation? I mean, I think this is, a, this is it, and if it doesn't work on your operating system for whatever reason, uh, the... Rust compilation is really easy to do, just using cargo. So it should be pretty accessible towards everyone, and the behavior should be pretty stable across all platforms. We've tested it on Windows, Mac, and Linux, I think. So cool. Can you run it? Should be good. Um, and just reveal. I feel like you should. Reveal Can I run it? it? Let's find out. I'm at, I I ran it, but I I I can't actually plug anything in because that's I okay. Have USB ports. Yeah, that's okay. But um. Yeah. So, so ideally, you, you would start this, and then you would plug something in, and it would automatically detect the um, serial port or COM port if you're on Windows. So you don't have to worry about finding out what that is. It just detects changes. So all good stuff. 
Yeah, so James, well, you're, James, you're very modest, but really what James has done here is eliminated two of the biggest pain points we had with uh, getting this started. So when we were trying to teach this, I would have to be like, oh, you're using a Mac. Okay, you need to go into terminal and type ls slash dev slash su asterisk. And then based on what pops up, you would select like one of those, you would copy one of those port names into a different command. And like people who have never done this before, we get lost in like the third step because it's confusing, you know, honestly, like you're using two tools to do something that one tool could do. So James literally wrote a tool that as soon, like, okay, two conditions. If you have this already plugged in, when you run the Hunator, it will list the different ports that are there and you can select it from, you know, just a numbered list, super easy. If you just run the Hunator and then you plug in the ESP8266 base board running the deauthor, it will automatically detect it and just run it. So you don't even need to know the port name. He's eliminated like the entire need to use this other annoying tool. We had to get people to to f like basically run to uh, to find what serial port this was connected to, and it ruined my day so many times because it just it wouldn't show up, and we weren't sure if the person like had done something wrong or if the board was dead or whatever. This is so easy now that I just have to stress that like. Since last year, the Hunator is the biggest, most important change to this project because before, like aside from the web interface, which was a very good universal uh, way of interacting with this, there was no good command line interface way to work with the ESP8266 chip. So like uh, this is a, a major development and ha has been made um, to just make this more accessible to beginners and people that want to get started. So um, Rust is a very cool language. Um, uh, James, why Rust? Rust because A, I'm a bit of a Rust fanboy, and B, <laughs> it's um, really easy to kind of compile on a lot of different operating systems. So one of Rust's big things is that you can keep things consistent across everything, cross-platform, and you don't need kind of... Um, you don't need a framework like .NET or anything like that. So it's it's really easy to get running. And it yeah, as you said, it, the whole kind of goal is lowering the barrier to entry so that everybody can use this. Cool. So once, uh, I think that that's everything we can show on your screen. So we can go ahead and switch back to mine. Um, but yeah, it's as simple as that to install this tool that will make it very, very easy to do these more advanced attacks. And if you know your way around Wireshark, for example, this is so cool. Like basically you can use this as like a pre-programmed wireless network adapter sort of that has all these attacks built into it and just plug it into your computer and start like telling it to, all right, create a bunch of beacons saying that you're this network and you have this type of security. And then all of a sudden in Wireshark, you can watch other devices trying to connect to this, uh, uh, to this ESP8266. Although Stefan has also added the ability to even do that on this as well. So. It's pretty crazy what this has learned to do over the course of the last year. Um, if you want to flash this yourself. So there's two ways for you guys to, to go about doing this. One way is if you want to support the team that did this, um, you can always pick up one of the boards. You can either get a D1 Mini um, that's pre-flash with the, the V3 of the D author, and also you get some cool hacker stickers as well. Um, you can grab that from hack.gay or hackerinterchange.com, whichever is easier for you to go to. Um, or if you're in the European Union, you can pick up the Andromeda D author, which is the cool custom version, um, which is right here. Uh, you can pick up one of these uh, in at uh, spacehoon.store. Um, but um, yeah, so again, United States orders are I'm going to be doing because I live in the United States and EU orders uh, Stefan is doing. So, oh, sorry, the second way I, I got carried away. So the second way of doing this is you can go buy your own. Um, no guarantees it will work. Um, no guarantees that it'll be like the right version of the, the D1 Mini or whatever, but like this should work across Node MC, like a Node MCU, a D1 Mini, any ESP8266 based development board. Very, very easy to find. They're very cheap. So if you already have one of these lying around and you want to try it out, we're not going to make you pay for an open source project. That's stupid. We're just hoping that enough people will be interested in supporting us and checking out some of the really cool features we built into the custom hardware that they'll actually buy the board and we'll be able to keep doing the research. So if you want to do this by yourself, then of course, you can just pick up one of these boards on Amazon, on AliExpress, if you're willing to wait for like a month and don't care that like, you know, some of them might be crushed. Um, but you can just load the firmware manually using the ESP tool. 
So on pretty much any computer that has Python 3 installed, you could just run pip, uh, pip3 install ESP tool or just pip install ESP tool. And oops, uh, in Linux, you can do apt install ESP tool. In Mac OS, you can install it via homebrew with brew install ESP tool. And this will allow you to flash the most recent firmware that Stefan has developed to this microcontroller. And we used to show you guys how to like open the file in Arduino and compile it and add the board. And it was so complicated and annoying. We basically completely removed all that this year. So this year we're just saying install ESP tool and we're going to just flash this board over manually. So if you want to get the latest version of the ESP8266 dauthor, you can click on this link here or go to github.com slash spacehoontech slash nightly dash dauthor. And you, this is accessible through the normal GitHub link as well. And here there's a list of uh, bin files that is the latest version, experimental version of the dauthor. And there's the v3 and the v2.5. The v2.5 is the one that has the web interface, and the v3 is the one that is the development special sexy version that we're talking about today. You can download this, and then going back here, oh, it's in a cursed format now. Oh no, okay, it's back. Um, and then we can just flash this over using the instructions on the GitHub. But basically, we just do esp tool.py dash b, which stands for baud rate 115200 dash p, and then we need to put in the port that this is connected to. And James, do you know a good way to get the port number of, a, of one of these ESP 8266s? Maybe on like any operating system? Oh, you know, the Hunator? Oh, you know, the Hunator. So yeah, you could run the Hunator and that will tell you what port this is connected to. So that's usually how I do this. Um, so then we type write underscore flash zero. That's like where we're going to start writing. And then the bin file. So we just, in my case, I'm just going to drag and drop the bin file, uh, the location of the bin file that I just downloaded from GitHub. That is all you need to flash this over and get the latest version. Would it be disingenuous to not show them? I feel like I should show you guys. Um, so let me go over to the terminal and we're doing stuff live now. Hooray. So that means that all sorts of stuff can and will go wrong. And, um, you know, what are you going to do? So, uh, all right. So in my terminal window, which I'm going to make very large for all of you, I'm going to run the Hunator, and I can see that the current dauthor that I have plugged in is this wacky thing right here. Now, sometimes I find that this doesn't, the formatting might be a little off for whatever reason. I don't know why, but I'm just going to ver verify this by typing. This is how you find it on a Mac OS computer, ls slash dev slash su asterisk. Wait. Oh, wait. No, sorry. I'm still the Hunator. Ha! <laughs> ls dev su, and I can see this is what I need to copy. So I think this is, this looks like, oh, no, it's not the same. So, okay, James, do you see the difference between these two? So, yes. yeah, so this little difference means that if you're trying to flash over, it actually won't quite work. So if, um, if we wanted to uh, maybe have this displayed slightly differently, um, I don't know. I don't know what the difference is, but I know that if I tried to flash this over, it wouldn't quite work. So, all right. So if I want to flash over the latest, oh wait, if I wanted to flash over the latest version of this, then what I can do is basically just take the instructions that I had before. I'm going to, uh, I thought I had this open. So ESP tool.py dash B, you know, okay. Uh, this is, I thought I had the, the command saved. I'm not going to go all the way through it, but trust me when I say that, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to go all the way through it. Sorry. There's just too many things that could go wrong at a live demonstration. But um, esp.tool.py, the baud rate, the port, uh, write flash, and then the file, and that will get you where you need to go. I just, I feel like I'm going to flash this, and it's going to corrupt the device, and then I won't be able to do the rest of the demo. And I've learned now, so I'm going to try cautiously here. OK, so opening Hunator, you just type Hunator. Um, that's pretty much it. It's uh, and also, I see we can type welcome, and it'll give us the current version of the Hunator. Is that of the Hunator or the, or the D author? That will probably be the D author. OK, cool. If memory serves me correctly. All right, so I'm going to type Hunator. I'm going to select option number three, and then welcome. There we go. OK, cool. So. Uh, what you just saw was the entire process of me connecting to the uh, 
the interface of this device. And I'm, I'm right now plugged into the custom Andromeda deauthor board that uh, Bricks and other members of our community have helped to develop. But it's as simple as that to just go ahead and get started. And in fact, Stefan has even implemented the start command, which will literally help you uh, just go through a walkthrough of most of the main features that are supported with the new version of the deauthor. So it's a really good way for you to just begin learning how to use this tool, even if you don't know the exact commands already. So I really like that. I think it's very beginner friendly and uh, I'm thankful that he's put that in there to get people started. So we've already gone through the Huna tour. Um, I'm gonna skip through this. Uh, we have a little, again, shout out to James. So again, thank you to James. And uh, the different commands we're gonna go through for the basic usage are the chicken command, of course, the start command, ram and help. So these are all very basic commands that give you uh, information about the device itself. So of course the chicken command is one of the most important. Oh, and if you want to exit, you just type exit. So the chicken, wait. No. There we go. I was so worried. I thought the whole thing was broken. So the chicken command, <laughs> If you get stressed out, we'll ground you. I think that this is a this is more like the psychological part of the project. So you know, if you find yourself getting stressed out with all this hacking, you can just type the chicken command for one of these very affirming chickens to drop onto your screen. Big shout out and thank you to Stefan for making this one possible. Now, if you want to check out the other commands that are available, again, kind of less critical, you can see RAM to see information about how much memory is available. Um, what are the other ones? We can uh, also, oh right, type start to just go through the basic settings. And probably the best command actually is the help command. So that help command goes through every single possible thing you can do and shows you the proper way of formatting it, plus all the optional arguments you can supply. So, oh my gosh, my computer's gonna die. Sorry, let me plug this in. That would be- That was horrifying. There we go, all right, we're good. So um, we can do everything from uh, beaconing fake networks to deauthentication attacks, to sending out probe frames pretending to be a device trying to connect to a network. Um, we can see results. We can see the uh, new received signal strength attack. There's lots of great stuff that we can do that's all accessible through the help menu. And of course we can all the, also do the help dash S and that shows a shortened version of the help menu. So if you don't want to scroll up through like four pages, you can always run this in order to, uh, to be able to see all the options just at a glance. So I'm really glad Stefan did that because like it, it's really hard sometimes to scroll through all, all these options if you just want to see one thing. All right, so basic commands, um, help of course, um, the chicken is mostly for psychological motivation. Start command is for walking through. The scan command, is something that is kind of the gateway to using this and will allow us to see all the nearby Wi-Fi devices. Before we do that, I'm going to make our producer very happy by using another new mode called demo. Now the demo mode allows us to basically hide our MAC address, which theoretically could be used to find our location and have annoying people on the internet who thinks it impresses me to send me my address, send me my address. So to avoid that, uh, Stefan specifically implemented this to make it so we could show off different scans and stuff without showing too much information about the specific device. So we're gonna go ahead and we've activated demo mode. So now we're just gonna type scan. So this is a very general scan. We're not specifying the channel and we're not specifying any other information like uh, the, the um, SSID or like anything like that. We're just saying, uh, or we're not specifying whether we want to find an access point or a specific device. So I could be scanning for a cell phone and you know uh, all the nearby wireless networks as well in this single scan. So I haven't really told it what I want, um, but Instead, it's done as good of a job as it can trying to find other things that you know are nearby and using Wi-Fi. So, okay, we can see that there's a lot of stuff nearby. We can see that one of the networks in particular is Rick rolling me. So one of the exercises we're going to do today is basically tracking this device down and getting retribution because 
what kind of inhuman monster would try to troll me by planting a Wi-Fi device that just rickrolls me every time I try to connect to Wi-Fi? That's inhuman and it's a crime that must be punished. So we can also see that there's two different returns that were uh, brought back from our scan. There's access points, as we can see up here, and these are all the nearby wireless networks, as well as the channel that they're on, the type of security that they're using, and the relative signal strength, as well as the vendor, which is really useful if you wanna, for example, search for a device that's using an alpha wireless chipset, which we have as result number one, or result number zero, because lists start at zero, of course, and, uh, or TP-Link, as we have the last one. And this can be used to identify things like Nest uh, doorbells or, or Ring doorbells or like the other types of surveillance cameras. You can identify them using the manufacturer. And I've also, be I believe that Stefan has now uh, allowed a filter to look for specific manufacturers, which I pushed very, very hard for to make it possible for you to do things like look for surveillance devices or manufacturers that make surveillance devices. So if you wanted to turn this into a, like a surveillance device finder, you could absolutely do that. So that's a basic command, but how do we do something more specific? Well, let's say that we want to hone in on a device. Um, we have a uh, uh, an expressive device over here, and let's say that we're interested in learning more about it, or another device that's actually connected to a network. So if we wanted to learn more about what's uh, connected to a specific network, then we can scan on that specific channel. So let's say we want to run a scan on channel uh, six. So if I do scan, and then I add an argument, I'll make this a little larger, scan uh, dash ch, and then uh, six. I can also specify other information like how long I want the scan to go on for, but I'm just gonna keep this relatively simple. In our first scan, we only found two devices that were connected to networks. Now the reason for that is because we weren't able to actually, uh, we weren't able to linger on that channel for long enough to see everything that was there. So now that we're actually doing this, let me make this smaller because we've got so many results, it's crazy. Um, now we can see there's actually tons of different devices connected to this network, but before we were jumping around to all of the different available uh, channels and listening on all of them. So we were dividing up our attention and we couldn't get a good result. So in the process of using the deauthor, the, it's pretty much always like first we do a scan to find out which network we're interested in or which, uh, which channel the device we're interested in is, in is on, and then we specify the channel so that we're not wasting our time on a channel that our target is not broadcasting on. Um, so that's a very quick introduction to how to run first a general scan and then a more specific scan, but it's very, very easy to do this. Now, um, deauthentication commands. Deauthentication attacks need to be used very carefully because this is the one that is illegal and can get you in trouble. So if we want to select a device uh, from the, uh, a network and we want to like kick it off the network, we can do that relatively easily. Um, but we basically just need to make sure that we have permission to do that and specify this by its AP value or station value. So what does that mean? Well, if I want to attack a specific device, let's say this expressive device, um, uh, well, no, I'll have to connect something, attack something that's connected to a network. So if I wanna, let's say I wanna attack this, this dumb printer. We can see it's a Sikio Epson printer. If I want to attack this printer, I can write D off. Well, actually, first let's type um, help dash S. So if I wanna run a D off command right here, I can see I need to give the access point value, the station value, and then uh, some more information if I want to. In this case, I'm just gonna do it and keep it very minimal. So I'm gonna say dauth, oh my God, it's the same color, whatever. Dioth, uh, and then st, and the station number is actually this number on the left side. So if I want to, oops, sorry. If I want to see which station I want to attack, it's station number one. You gotta be careful because let's start at zero. And if you get this wrong, you'll be attacking the wrong device. I can also attack a list of devices. So if I wanna supply like three different devices, I can do that too. So um, I'm gonna select number one. By the way, James, are you looking at the chat? Are you replying to people? Please do that. I am doing that. Okay, cool, sweet, thank you. Um, and I'm ripping space on merge. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, so again, I'm just gonna triple check. We're gonna attack station number one. So we can uh, indicate which station we wanna go after by just dauth dash st1. And now boom, nobody can use the printer. This is of course in retaliation against whoever is rickrolling me. So I can, let's say that 
let, let me give a, a legal explanation of, of this attack maybe. Let's say that I'm, I'm going into an Airbnb and um, I notice after a scan that there's a, a Wi-Fi camera and the signal gets stronger and stronger when I go into the bathroom. Let's say I don't wanna, I don't wanna deal with that at all. And I don't think that this weird spy camera should be able to connect to Wi-Fi in the bathroom of my Airbnb. Well, if I wanted to specify that device and then just make it so it cannot connect for the duration of my stay, I could kick a, like an illegitimate or unwanted spy camera or a malicious IoT device or even a nosy neighbor who maybe asked for the Wi-Fi password like six months ago and then like seems to have remembered it for their Xbox now. Um, you can kick them off the network using this command and these are legal things to do. Now, if you're neighbor is playing uh, music really, really loud on their Wi-Fi connected speakers. Can you de-auth them and kick them off? No, because if that person knows a little bit about like Wi-Fi attacks and they're running Wireshark, they can detect you doing it. They can also use this tool right here to tell what direction it's coming from and they can call the police and you can get in a lot of trouble for doing that. So this is the attack you really need to be careful of. So I'm gonna type stop. And now everyone in our house is able to use the printer again. Hooray! So that's a brief uh, demonstration of the most uh, destructive attack that uh, the deauthor has to offer. And it's generally a pretty easy way of uh, kicking a device off the network constantly. You can also fire up Wireshark and watch this actually happening. Now by default, this will send a mix of deauthentication and disassociation packets, so it kind of flips back and forth between the two. Um, but if you want to specify that you only want deauth packets or you only want disassociation packets, you can study the effects they have on, other, on specific devices if you want to, because you can manually specify that as one of the arguments. Um, which I think is really cool. And you can see that it's the last argument right here, dash M for mode. You can select deauth, uh, disassoc, uh, or both. So now let's go on to the beacon command. James, do you know what a beacon is? A beacon uh, sends out Wi-Fi packets. Yeah, so a beacon, um, or beacon frames rather, are, is how your yeah. cell phone and your laptop can come up with a list of all the nearby Wi-Fi networks. So any Wi-Fi access point, like a, a, a router or your phone when it's like offering up a hotspot, will put out like a, like a hundred, like, like a lot of different packets per minute, letting everybody around them know that, hey, this access, this access point is here, uh, it has these properties, it has these speeds, and it's using this security. So it basically is creating two things. It's creating the ability to appear on people's uh, little like Wi-Fi scope so that they can see it nearby. So it's a way to like put, for example, a really annoying message uh, on someone's screen as is currently happening to me. Or you can also influence other devices near you into thinking that there's a Wi-Fi network they've connected to before. Now what that causes is an automatic reaction. It causes the nearby device, like again, a laptop, a cell phone, whatever, to attempt to join the network. And if it was like a coffee shop network, like an open network, they will actually go ahead and join that network without telling the user, especially if we were to encourage that device to you know, disconnect from a friendly network by uh, deauthing them, which we can do simultaneously. So a particular attack we can do with this is we can beacon a network and then watch to see which devices are trying to connect. And that will give us a lot of information such as, hey, you know, if this is a, a school network, we know that that person has been to this university and connected to their network before. If it's a corporate network, hey, we know this person is an employee of this government contractor. Interesting news. The fact that you can like find, I did a presentation for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I created a JPL detector where anytime an employee walked by, the, the light would turn red. And it was just because it was creating the networks at JPL. It was beaconing the networks at JPL. And anytime one of those scientists walked by, their phone would try to connect to the network. So this gives us a lot of really cool special powers when it comes to Wi-Fi because we can influence devices nearby into thinking there's a network that's not really there. And if it's a really common network, for example, Starbucks Wi-Fi, James, I have a question. If I were to yes. uh, take, a, take my phone, connect it to a VPN that goes to Japan, and then go to like a, a really crowded concert, pre-COVID of course, and uh, turn on my phone's hotspot with the name Google Starbucks and no password, what do you think would happen? 
devices would try to connect to your phone. They wouldn't try to connect, James. They would actually immediately <laughs> connect if they had ever connected to a Starbucks network before. Because the phone is like, oh, sweet, I don't have to use cellular data. I know this network. I know that name. Got to be safe. So then, James, you know what would happen to everyone's web pages when they loaded? Your phishing site? No, it would be in Japanese. Oh, sorry. I missed that part of your, your scenario. If you want to test this, feel free to just connect to a VPN that goes to another country and then pop up an access point on your phone that is a really common access point in your area. And you'll find nearby devices will automatically join. And then the IP address will be in like Japan or something. So it'll make other people's websites just load in another language. Very funny, but just a, a small demonstration of how you can actually take over someone's device's internet connection just by beaconing the right name. Now, um, beaconing is different from creating an access point. Beaconing is saying, hey, I'm a network, I'm here, but not actually taking any of the steps that allow you to connect to the network. So while this device will, while uh, creating beacon frames will cause nearby devices to try to connect, they will not succeed unless we actually create an access point. So let's uh, talk about that. So actually, I guess it comes later on. Okay, so we'll do that a little bit later on, but uh, the new version of the dauthor actually has the ability to create access points as well, where devices can connect and we can even serve them a phishing page. So, all right, so let's talk about um, the Karma attack. So if we want to take a look and see what devices are uh, actually like creating, uh, well, all right, how do I explain this? So the probe command, doesn't have a lot of uses, to be honest with you. But one thing that is useful is finding devices like Hack5 hacking tools that are automatically executing the Karma attack. Now, James, do you know what the Karma attack is? I am not familiar. Cool. All right, I get to explain it. So, all right. So one attack that was developed early on uh, in Wi-Fi was when a device nearby is beaconing out saying, or when it's sending out what's called probe requests, where it says, hey, is this network nearby? Uh, a hacker device would just instantly respond and say, hey, sure, I'm that, I'm that network, join me right now. And it basically just sits there and waits for nearby devices to check, to call out and say, hey, is this network I joined recently still there? And it will just automatically start an access point that has that network name and uh, will try to lure devices into connecting to it. It's very, very sneaky. So we can actually detect devices that are doing that by sending out these probe requests, by basically pretending to be like a, a smartphone or a printer or whatever that's trying to connect to this network. And if there's a, like a Hack5 device nearby, uh, like a Wi-Fi pineapple, it will actually start creating the access points that we're sending out probe frames for. So it'll hear our uh, Wi-Fi D author being like, hey, I'm trying to connect to Starbucks Wi-Fi. Are you still there? And it will just pop up Starbucks Wi-Fi in response. And that's how we can catch hackers that are nearby using, for example, um, Hack5 Gear or the Karma attack to maybe target our Wi-Fi or do sneaky stuff. So this is more like a counterintelligence, a counterintelligence attack. It's like kind of specific. So it's not really as useful as the other ones, but it's still kind of cool. <clears throat> so, okay. Now we're gonna go into the crown jewel. We're going to go into the RSSI or the fox hunting. Uh, and this is something I asked for for such a long time. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to unplug my dauthor and I'm going to add a directional antenna. So a directional antenna means that we're going to be able to just move this around in order to find the source of the signal. We don't need to walk around like an idiot anymore, playing hot and cold to try to determine where it is. We can just stand there like a very smart person and just move this back and forth in sort of a parade wave to find the source of the signal. Again, we could find out which one of our neighbors has cracked our Wi-Fi and connected their Xbox. We could also find the best Wi-Fi, uh, uh, the best position in our house to put our Wi-Fi antenna to get access to our uh, neighbor's Wi-Fi for our Xbox. It really goes kind of both ways. So I'm going to go back to my terminal window. I'm going to go back into the Hunator, select option three, and then I'm just gonna type help dash S. And first I need to do a scan. So I'm gonna type scan. <clears throat> oh wait, no. Okay, well, there we go. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna run this again. No. Stop. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna run this again. No. It's just, James, it crashed. 
I've never seen so many errors before. Big news. Yeah. Flawless program. Okay, there we go. Exit. All right. Let's try this there again. Are actually, there is an update that's ready for the Hunator. I just need to merge a bunch of PRs and test some stuff. But soon, soon new features. Soon. Okay. All right. So now we're Boom. scanning again in demo mode. And uh, what I want to do is try to find the network that has been trolling. So I'm also going to make sure that uh, the antenna is plugged in properly. And sometimes you'll also find that by scanning on different networks, you get different access points. So if I, let me stop. If I type scan AP instead of just scan all, then sometimes I'll get like different networks. Oh, and I can also specify that I don't want to uh, go into networks that don't concern me. So if I want to do scan, and then I want to do uh, dash ch, let's say one through eleven, then I'm not going to be on you know twelve and thirteen and fourteen, which like don't really apply in the United States anyway. Okay, there we go, finally. So after a couple of scans, I was able to identify this evil network that has been trolling me. And I can see that it's operating on channel one. So James, what do you think the next step would be after we identify the channel that we're looking on? Scan that channel specifically. That's right. So we're going to type scan uh, CH1. And just confirm, yep, here we go. Never going to give you up. Uh, and we can see it here. So now we're going to do the RSSI command. And again, we have now connected this fancy directional antenna, which is this is just an alpha wireless antenna that I put a, a great sticker on, which also we have at our store on hack.gay. Um, and if you want to, the sticker, we don't sell the alpha wireless antennas. You get that yourself. But we do have the Andromedas. So all right, we see never going to give you up right here. It's a uh, Access point number one. So remember, when we're specifying which one we want to go after, we can specify via access point, um, you know, AP one. So I'm going to type help dash s. We can see that the RSSI just wants the AP value, so we'll do RSSI dash AP one. And then what else does it need? Um, time to refresh. Uh, the channel. Oh, right. So we want to make sure that this is on channel one, because otherwise we won't see very much information. So I'm going to type CH1. Uh, and then what else? Oh, and we can also do the update time. So the update time allows us to determine like how fast um, the screen updates or how many um, how many times it refreshes per second. So or, or how much how quickly it refreshes overall. So I'm going to do an update time uh, of like 200 milliseconds, because hell yeah. So let's go ahead and run this and see if it works. Cool. All right, so it's working. So I'm going to go ahead and lift this up. And you can see on the left side, we have the, rel the average signal strength for that reading, uh, as well as a little bar. And then on the right side, we see how many packets we've received. So if we only see one or zero packets, it means we need to slow down the refresh time. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Oh, it means we need to slow down the refresh time. So let me go ahead and move this around. And we're going to try to determine where this evil network is coming from. Did I just crash it? No, I didn't. OK, cool. Um, so if I turn it this way, you can see the signal strength goes down. And the RSSI on the left side, it's important to, to think of this as like the percentage of loss. Um, so like if the lower the signal, uh, or like the lower the number, is actually better. So as I move this around, you can see the signal's increasing a little bit. And now it's maxed out. So at this point, when I'm pointing it right here, in this direction here, the signal's at 100%. Now if I turn it a little bit further, it goes down again. So without having to get up and walk around, I've basically determined that this angle right here is exactly where the access point is. And in fact, it's, it, it is right there. I can, I can see it because I put it there. So, we did another example of this where we had um, a rock in one box and then you know an access point with a battery in the other. And we had to determine like which one had the access point without touching them. And you can use this method to just go like, hmm, hmm, it's that one. 
It's, it really is that simple. And again, if you're coming up on like a creepy camera that's not supposed to be there, or if you're coming up on something else that, uh, you know, maybe somebody joined to your network that's, that doesn't have permission to be joined and you need to know who's been accessing my Wi-Fi this whole time, you can just sweep around and just like that, be able to determine who is doing it. Uh, so I think that this is one of the best new features. Um, and I personally think that it makes the Andromeda deauthor board super, super useful because of the ability to add that external antenna. So I love this. I really think it's cool. And um, even if you don't have the external antenna, you can still walk around or just you know put the, uh, the D1 Mini on a really long cable and kind of go like that and uh, play hot and cold to use this feature. So it still does work. So there's some other signals intelligence attacks we can do uh, to determine patterns of life or other information about the person who owns the device. And what I mean here is we can figure out things they've done in the past, um, like going to a school, being a member of a particular organization, by which Wi-Fi networks they've joined. And we can actually pull this information out of their phone um, using uh, a couple different methods. So we're gonna go ahead and demonstrate the access point, um, which is something we haven't done yet. And here I'm gonna go ahead and type help s and I'll make it a bit smaller. Ugh. Well, that's not how you spell help. There we go. Oh, it's still terrible. Okay, that's a bit better. So we are gonna be looking for uh, the AP command. So the AP command's right here. And this is basically how we're going to create a fake network that is different from a beacon because it's actually possible for a device to join. So let's say that I want to know if anybody here has been to Fuddruckers. This is a, a very popular restaurant in the United States. In fact, it's our national restaurant. So I'm going to go ahead and type AP and then SSID. And then I'm going to say um, in quotes Fuddruckers Wi-Fi. And then um, I can also specify if it's a hidden network or if it's not a hidden network. I can specify the channel, which will be channel one. And then um, I can also specify if I want there to be security on it. So uh, in this case, I'm not going to specify uh, because I just want to create a, an access point and keep it really, really simple. But I can also do that if I want. So let's see. Uh, see if that works. OK. Oh, wait. I forgot something. So now I'm creating an access point, and if I were to do a scan, I would see that there is actually an access point here, and any device nearby that is ever connected to Fuddruckers Wi-Fi is going to go wild. So if you were in Europe, this would almost be like an American detector. So I'm going to go ahead and press stop because I forgot to do one thing, and uh, that is to monitor as well. So I think it's dash M. And actually, I don't see it in the instructions, so that's kind of, oh, wait, it's because I'm doing this short version. Let me run the, the big boy version. Help. So uh, under access point, we can see the SSID, the password, hidden network channel, SSA. Hmm. Hmm. OK, well, whatever. Um, I think I remember that it's dash M for monitor, I think. No, it's not that. Maybe it's dash A. Yes, I said you ran them. Hmm. Well, it seems like the most updated version of this actually might be missing a feature that I was trying to show off. So what I'm trying to show off is the ability to watch for devices trying to join a network. So let me see if it's uh, documented anywhere else. Beacon. I guess I can show it off with um, dash M. Oh, OK, let's do this with a beacon. So I can do the same thing with beacon. So I'm going to do beacon. Well, let's do help dash s. So for beacon, we'll do SSID FUD Ruckers Wi-Fi. Then we need uh, Sorry, Spacehun just chimed in on Discord. He said auth command, apparently. I don't know if that's of significance to you. Oh, it's totally of significance, because that's exactly what I was <laughs> looking for. Yeah, tell him that I hope he recovers from the snake bite. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Snake bite. <laughs> yeah, remember? That's why he can't do the presentation today. 
um, was because of the, the snake bite. So I'm going to make the this a, an open network. So ENC is encryption, so open. And I don't need to specify that, but I am. And then also dash M for monitoring. I'm just going to double check that. I want to make, I've, we're doing all this live, you guys. So there's going to be things that go wrong. We're just trying to make sure it works. Off. Okay. So it's working. All right, so let me explain to you guys what I just did because it was kind of a tangled mess. But what I'm doing now is I'm creating an access point called Fuddruckers Wi-Fi, and I am looking out for devices that are trying to connect to it. So let's say I am a, a greedy fat American hungry for Fuddruckers, and I am wild. My phone is wildly excited to find a Fuddruckers in the middle of Europe. What are the odds? So right now I should be broadcasting a, a, a tempting enticing Fuddruckers access point to anyone nearby. And if uh, anybody is to join that network, then it should record that and show me information about the device, which is a pretty good way of being able to monitor devices nearby that have all joined the same thing. And again, uh, this is live, so it might take me a little bit to actually see it on my phone. Uh, I can also, in order to speed up this process, if I know which network a device is already on, I can create an access point um, by uh, that they'll see more quickly by making sure to create it on the network that they're on. So if I really wanted to do this, I actually probably should have done this on channel six. All right, so I finally see it, and boom, the finale. So you can see that um, I am now getting the real MAC address of this phone um, because it is dropping its fake MAC address and trying to connect desperately, I might add, to Fuddruckers Wi-Fi. Now this does two things. It, whoa, calm down, buddy. This allows me to track that A, you know, there's somebody that's been to Fuddruckers here. So I know that in the past, uh, a Fuddruckers employee or patron is nearby, critical information. But also, I can tell you know, information about that person's device, the manufacturer of the device. Uh, it allows me to actually get that device to connect to me. So if I'm a hacker and I want a list of different networks that will cause someone's device to connect over to me so I can serve them like a phishing page and get their credentials, I now have the ability to force their device to connect to my fake network anytime I want. That's pretty powerful. Because if you think about it, that list of networks, and you see, my phone is going ham on this network. It really, really, really wants to connect to Fuddruckers because automatically your phone will connect to any network, or will try to connect to any uh, network that has the same name and security type as a, a network that it's connected to before. And that's a big deal for us hackers because it means that we can capture your phone and learn where you've been. So let's say that you're some fancy defense contractor. If I know the name of your internal employee access point, I can not only basically determine when you're nearby, but I can also capture your device and maybe serve you a phishing page. So um, forcing a target to connect to an evil access point is a pretty involved process. And I don't think we're going to do this live live. I'm just going to show you guys the steps of, of doing this so you can see how easy it is. Because frankly, it's very, 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 very easy to do this wrong. But one thing that we can do is if we find a device that's connected to an access point, and we've already taken the first step of finding another network that that device trusts, that the, it'll automatically switch to, we can just do a scan find uh, the device, and then simultaneously kick it off the network while also creating an access point for it to join at the same time. So if I, uh, in this case, I've aliased it as well. You can alias devices to give them a name that's easy to remember. It's just another way of keeping track of all these devices as you're scanning them. So I call this hurting a device, but this command up at the top right here, dauth station MacBook, um, semicolon, semicolon, ap s testnet, um, dash p password one two three. This is creating an access point called testnet with a password of one two three, and it's also simultaneously kicking the MacBook Pro off of the network it's currently connected to. So the result that we would see here is at the bottom we would see oops we would see when the MacBook Pro is given um, an IP address and the MacBook Pro would then be redirected to a phishing page of our choosing. So this is very very sneaky because imagine like uh, one scenario is like a printer 
that's like been connected to different networks in the past. If you could figure out which network the printer had been connected to and then force it to connect to you, you could like go through like the, the printing logs, you could try to install malware, you could try to dig the credentials for the Wi-Fi network out of it. Like there's all sorts of stuff you can do by like attacking IoT devices or cell phones or laptops using this technique by first extracting device, uh, extracting network names their device already trusts and then connecting to, uh, or rather forcing them to connect to an evil version of that network while kicking them off of the legitimate version. So you can see in our result, um, we got switched over to a network called Testnet, which was our malicious access point. And of course, this also has the added benefit of unmasking uh, the MAC, the real MAC address of the device so we can track it more easily. Although in newer versions of some Android phones and on Windows computers, they will pick a per network MAC address. And while that will always be the same for that specific uh, Wi-Fi network name, it will change, the device will give a different MAC address uh, for different Wi-Fi networks it joins. So that's a little nuance on how that works. So let's talk about extracting a list of networks the target has joined before. And I feel like a bunch of people are going to get in trouble for going to strip clubs or something when they shouldn't have. So if you've joined networks that you uh, that are connected to places you shouldn't have gone to, take this part in our, our uh, presentation to go through and delete them. Because um, if you're going to get in trouble for attending Hooters when you should have been doing work, then uh, this might be how you get caught. So we wanted to go through and add the ability to do scripting. So I was like, James make it so that you can script. And he was just like, it, it can't be done. And then I was like, okay, cool. And then like two days later, he was just like, all right, it's done. So that that uh, is pretty much how we got the ability to do scripting. James, is that how you remember things? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you're like, you're like, I need it in like two days. And I'm like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it's it's really like, probably not a good implementation and I haven't tested it in many months but if it still works <laughs> sure I won't complain so this is basically the result of me requesting like hey I want to be able to load a big list of really common SSIDs for the that's uh, network names for the Southern California area and basically read them from a text file on my computer. So what this does is it allows me to script whatever attack I want, save it in a text file, and then just type hoon read, and then, for example, ssids.txt, and that should just do it. So I'm actually a little, um, I think it might actually work, but I'm a little afraid to try. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me see what happens. Sorry guys, sorry guys, sorry for the mess. That's my uh, that's my stuff. All right, let me go to. Is it still here? So if so, there hasn't been like an update released in a while. So, in theory, famous last words, nothing should have changed really. Yeah. Okay, I still see it. So if I do, hoon read, and then. Uh, SSIDs. You can see this is just a list of all these like uh, wireless network names. Um, oh, I hope that this is the right one. It might not be, but let's see. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. So what this is doing is it's reading everything in. Um, I actually didn't. This isn't the version that also includes the uh, the commands. So uh, I would need to also like specify these were the access points I wanted to create, but. It allows you to take something that uh, is normally really annoying to do, like creating 50 fake networks all at the same time. I created a little Python tool that allows me to take a list and turn it into, oh, is it beacons.txt? Sorry, I think I just remembered. Like, did I make beacon.txt? Please make it beacon.txt. I just want to show it. That would be so cool. But no, I think I didn't. Um, but anyway, I made this little Python tool to make it so that anybody who wants to, you can just make a, oh, it's here. Okay, so here you can see the commands are actually there, beacon, and then all the different access points I want to create. So before I ruin this, I'm going to go back here, and then I'm going to do hoon read. Hope you guys like live demos, because that's what we're serving up. <laughs> Figure it out eventually. All right, so after I took that big long list of just access point names, I can um, run it through my little Python tool, which turns it into uh, this little text file. And then if I run it, oh, I'm so proud of myself, you guys, look at this. So it is creating all of these access points right now. 
Um, and it is monitoring as well to see if anybody's trying to connect to them all at the same time. Are you guys not impressed by this? This is what we spent our entire year on. So, uh, so basically, if I were to open up my cell phone or like, uh, let's go ahead, I'm just gonna open this scanner. Um, I can just go ahead and like let this run for a minute. Uh, and I can see, oh, Whopper Wi-Fi. Um, I can see Tender Greens. Well, I haven't seen a, one of those in a very long time. Phil's Coffee, The Road Away In. So I can see that like, in fact, um, there's a bunch of Wi-Fi networks that the JW Marriott, the Hollywood Guests in. Like this is basically bait. We are trying to trick devices into revealing that they've connected to one of these before. And let's see, you can see um, my phone recognizes the Camden, uh, the Camden whatever uh, Wi-Fi network. I can also, if I select like the days in, you can see that it rats me out immediately and tells me, hey, there's a device nearby, this is its MAC address, and it recognizes both the Camden whatever and the days in. So, you know, if I'm trying to build a background about someone, um, I guess some examples I could do would be, uh, okay, this person with this MAC address has an AT&T cell phone, because I can see they're trying to connect automatically to AT&T Wi-Fi, which is built into a lot of different um, access points. I can see that they are a patron of Phil's Coffee, that um, they have recently been to the LA Times, but they don't work there, they were just a guest. And I can also see that at some point they have been to a Denny's. Now, like, if I wanted to be a fake psychic, I think that that's everything I need, right? Like, you know, I'd be like, I sense that you're unhappy with your AT&T service. So like, how do you know that? And it's just like, well, I can, I get a vision of you at Phil's Coffee. Have you been to Phil's Coffee? Maybe sometime in between going to Denny's or checking in at the LA Times. And they're just like, how do you know what you know? Like, this is a way you can basically like pretend to know a lot about someone. But of course it could also be abused. We could use this just as well to detect JPL employees, SpaceX employees, or government contractors. James. Just picturing you going up to people and being like, I sense that you have at some point gone to a Denny's. <laughs> <laughs> like, ex expecting people to be amazed. My favorite is I did this presentation in a room and it's just like, raise your hand if you've recently been to the Grand Canyon. And one girl in the back is just like, how did you? And I was like, and you stayed in the days in, huh? Was it nice? And she's just like, what is going on? You can, you can kind of convince people that um, like their phone is actually giving up more information than it really is with this technique. So for like a human, uh, like a sort of um, just tricking people kind of way of going about this, like one way of social engineering is just using this information to make people think you know more about them than you actually do. So. You should check this out because your phone is vulnerable to this. Nobody's phone is immune to this unless you go through and delete every extraneous Wi-Fi network. So a lot of the development that we have been doing the last year has been exploiting these sorts of behaviors in various Wi-Fi devices to give us more information out of the, of the phone than uh, you're really supposed to be able to get. So breaking privacy and security has kind of been what we wanted to do. And this is the gargantuan command that we loaded up with three words. Hoon, read, and then the location of the file. Those three words, I guess, um, are all that we need to compress a really, really, really big command like this one into something that's super easy to do. So that's why I love this for beginners who are getting started with this. Um, you know, if you wanna take a list of Wi-Fi networks in your area, run them through my little Python tool if you're lazy, and then um, just like end up with this really easy to script result that you can do through this cross-platform tool. It's a great way to be able to learn attacks that other people have scripted and then put online or save your favorite attacks so that you don't have to constantly retype them. So yeah, and again, we can now see where someone has been. And this is really useful information, but again, we're only gonna see networks that we are creating. So for a long time, phones would beacon out the last like five networks they had, had connected to, which was a really bad security practice. This, uh, and manufacturers realized this was such an invasion of privacy, they, they made it so that phones no longer do this. We're basically rolling back the clock, and this is kind of like an active karma attack where we're putting out so many fake networks that the odds are devices nearby will have connected to at least some of them if they're super common. So that's pretty much the extent of our planned demonstrations. Um, also some planned uh, features and updates, um, maybe like um, me sleeping for one, but that's not what this is. Um, so wait, sleep, and monitoring um, are actually now all implemented. So when I originally did these slides, uh, 
they were not, but uh, things move pretty quickly. So you can now do uh, the sleep function, which allows you to pause between commands um, and run things concurrently, which is really cool. But the biggest update to this is that Stefan is working on an ESP32 version of uh, our Wi-Fi attack platform that has a lot of the advanced attacks here, but a lot more horsepower, storage space, uh, compatibility. Um, it has native Bluetooth, or sorry, native USB. Um, there's lots of upgrades that uh, the new uh, ESP32 um, S uh, allows you to do when it comes to Wi-Fi hacking and just making this a really simple process for everyone. So look forward to next year, we'll hopefully be presenting on a, an entirely new platform for Wi-Fi hacking that is based not on the ESP8266, but on the ESP32S. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, it took a lot of work uh, for Stefan. Um, again, may he uh, recover from his, his non-lethal snake bite. And um, where I'm really, really looking forward to helping um, through a lot of badgering, um, guide the development of the next version of this platform. So some other stuff that I have thought that I would like to include is adding phishing pages that are a bit more detailed. We have a section that we've cut out just for time and the fact that it's very kind of elaborate um, that allows you to pop up a phishing page where you can get someone to type in whatever you want. Um, and we want to make that customizable so people can easily load up a phishing page and be able to try it out and see how realistic it looks. We also, um, and this is my personal thing that I want, um, I want to be able to trigger a script when a certain device is nearby. So if I have this plugged into my computer and I want to run a Python script on my computer to maybe lock it down or, or unlock it or whatever I want to do, I want to be able to use this through the Hunator as a trigger to do something when a certain device is in proximity to, uh, to the receiver. So we also want to be able to load bigger lists of fake networks, which is definitely going to happen with the ESP32, but also you can use the beacon spammer, which can load substantially more fake networks if that's what you want to do. That's how I've done a lot of my research. And eventually I also want to redirect people to a Grabify or Canary token tracking link so that we get all this information about them and then we redirect them at the end so that once they get their normal connection back, they get redirected to a tracking link that tells us, for example, like, uh, their carrier, their IP address, and all this other information about that individual. So lots of other stuff we could add, stuff we could add to this uh, attack platform. But I'm frankly just really impressed with all the stuff that Stefan has made happen um, with the help of the community uh, for such a small, cheap little microcontroller to be so useful. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm very very happy with how this project has gone. So thank you everyone for attending. I'm going to jump into the chat and we'll do a brief little Q&A where we try to answer some of the questions that have come up. Um, if you want to check out the class resources, I have included the slides here at this link uh, right here. If you want to buy a board and you're in the United States, you can go to hackerinterchange.com or just hack.gay and you can buy it there. If you want to buy a board in the European Union, and again, this is the fancy Andromeda deauthor board, but we also sell pre-flashed versions of the D1 Mini if you want to support our group and also get a couple really great hacker stickers. One of the saddest things is that we don't get to exchange stickers this year. So anybody who orders during C3 is going to get a bunch of extra hacker stickers that we picked up from C3 last year that we have in a giant bucket. So if you're feeling sad, you can pick up a D1 Mini and get a bunch of hacker stickers as well. Um, you can all, of course, always follow me on Twitter at Cody Kinsey. Um, uh, you can check out our upcoming workshops at our meetup group, which is Cyber Weapons Lab LA. It's not really LA anymore. It's just everywhere because of the pandemic. We don't even live in LA anymore. Um, and of course, if you want to check out the full version of this class where we go through stuff that we couldn't fit into this version because it's just too much, you can check out hack.gay. And uh, we have a couple Udemy classes that go through using the V3 deauthor, as well as a couple labs, examples, code, uh, everything. And of course, we appreciate it. Both we and Stefan make money every time someone takes the Udemy class. So if you already have your own board and you want to support us, you can always take the Udemy class. And uh, we very much appreciate that as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back to uh, the big blue button and start answering questions. Uh, James, do you have anything else to add? No, I think I think my chat is broken. I think I was replying earlier, but um, I think I may not be able to see stuff right now. I'm not sure what's going on. But no, I think you I think you hit everything on the head, really. Yeah, so um, I see a couple of people talking about the ESP32 versus the ESP8266 and also 5 gigahertz. James, does um, does the deauthor support 5 gigahertz? No, that's a hard restriction of the 
ESP8266, and I think the ESP32 as well. So currently there is nothing available from our group, and I don't think anything planned from our group to support that because the producers of those chips, I don't even think they make a 5 gigahertz capable chip right now. They do but not. They've, they've talked about it. They've talked about it, but um, no, no hard dates for that yet. Right. So there is some hope on the horizon because we've identified a Texas Instruments chip that does support 5 gigahertz, but compared to the ESP8266 or the ESP32, it is quite expensive. So, like, it kind of... It, it just brings the price up on this uh, and also the price of development up substantially to support 5 gigahertz, but it, it is a problem. If you're dealing with, for example, a device that supports 2.4 or 5 gigahertz and then you just attack one of them, then um, the the current implementation of the deauthor cannot do anything with 5 gigahertz. So that is a restriction just of the hardware and the fact that these microcontrollers are just currently not made for 5 gigahertz, and that's why you see most IoT devices don't support five gigahertz because they're based on these chips. So that's why they're so affordable and so reliable because they've been in so many people's hands that the, doc the documentation is very, very clear. It's easy to use them like, uh, and lots of people have worked on them. So they're very well understood. But some of this other stuff is just like quite expensive to develop. So that's why five gigahertz hasn't been implemented. Now, as for the ESP32, there's basically the same situation where the SDK is restricted from being able to send out certain types of packets, but, and I'm not at liberty to discuss too much more until we do an official announcement, there have been some advances in getting around this. So you guys can expect a new Wi-Fi hacking platform in 2021 that is going to be completely different and based on the ESP32S. And um, it's very exciting. I, again, I wish I could tell you guys more, but Safan's not here. If he was you know, not recovering from his non-lethal snake bite, then I'm sure he would tell you all about it. But unfortunately, uh, we'll have to announce that later. But just a little tease on the stuff we're working for. Again, no five gigahertz, but it will support native USB and have uh, the ability to do a lot more because of the increased horsepower and storage space. Cool. So if anybody has any other questions, if anybody has questions about the antennas, by the way, I this is a directional panel antenna, but we've even tested a um, like a giant like uh, Yagi antenna with this, and it works quite well. Um, you need to make sure you have the right like mail to mail or I, yeah, I think it's like mail to mail adapters for these to make sure that they plug into the alpha wireless antennas. But for like the average uh, Wi-Fi antenna you'll buy on Amazon, the uh, adapter that this comes with works perfectly. So yeah, I found that this is great for signal hunting or it's great for broadcasting like a weird network, like a really long distance. And this antenna was relatively cheap um, and very easy to use. You can also use like a massive omnidirectional antenna if you really just want to boost the signal. There's lots of cool stuff you can do with this when it comes to putting on a directional antenna and using the ability that BRICS has allowed for us by adding the quick change option on the uh, ESP8266. Ah yes, and James has one as well. Um, so, yeah, I also just want to point out um, that the RSSI feature, the like fox hunting feature, is still like probably the newest feature that's been implemented, aside from the demo mode, which is supposed to sometimes hide our back addresses. Um, and this is something that is really cool. I encourage you guys to try out, uh, experiment with, give us feedback on, because it has not really been done before. And it was really, really cool to be able to uh, to be part of the development on that. Because I feel like for teaching people about Wi-Fi hacking, being able to track down a device is probably one of the most fun things you can do, like Wi-Fi fox hunting. Uh, so being able to teach people how that works and do a little like demo with friends or something where you can track down a device, I think is a great way of using this little tool in a practical fashion. And also you won't get in trouble. Oh, one more thing that's on the roadmap. So something that we're working on is um, being able to use these ESP8266s as uh, reactive targets. So we want to make sure that you guys can um, try out like Wi-Fi hacking without getting in trouble by simulating access points, simulating handshakes. There were a couple things that came out of C3 that I didn't get to feature in this presentation. And one shout out that I have, um, if I still have it up somewhere, I hope I do. Um, it's Firefox maybe? Nah, I lost it. Um, one thing that I will slowly try to find uh, is the ability to simulate a Wi-Fi handshake on a single ESP8266 device. Now what that means is when Stefan and I were at C3 last time, I asked him if, um, not my screen yet, Michael. Um, 
I asked him if it was possible to simulate traffic from two different devices on a single ESP8266 by just basically playing back traffic that we captured beforehand. So we found out that actually it is. And all right, you can switch to my screen now. And uh, a little shout out to Stefan for creating, um, I call this the ham shake injector. Uh, this is a file that you can uh, load up on the ESP8266 just the same as you would um, any other uh, firmware. And it creates a handshake. And you can actually go ahead and crack this. And I'm giving away the password for it. The only downside to this is that if you want to change the network it creates and the password, um, you, you basically have to like re, uh, like recompile the entire thing. So this is kind of like a one-off game that Stefan and I worked on to just show off how you can create what looks like traffic from two different devices and create an actual crackable Wi-Fi handshake with a single ESP8266 device. So if you want to practice Wi-Fi handshake cracking, which you currently cannot do on the ESP8266, we, we are not able to capture a handshake yet. Um, but if you want to practice um, like uh, Wi-Fi password cracking, like on like on your MacBook Pro, which can capture handshakes but can't do deauthing, then you can go just go ahead, load this up on an ESP8266, and let it play, and it will play a Wi-Fi handshake every I think every couple of seconds. So it's a really cool way to get started, being able to crack something if you only have one device, because this is usually you would have to have an access point and a client connecting to it, and this is one way that you can get around that. So another way that you can uh, do this is another project that Stefan and I worked on. So let me see if I can find it on my GitHub. So the Wi-Fi Dual is a solution that's a little bit different. If you guys want to create a Wi-Fi hacking target that is actually able to be changed easily, then you can just connect two ESP8266 boards together and then over a serial monitor, just send them the access point name and the Wi-Fi password to create. And it'll go ahead and change the network name and password it's using. Now, what this is actually doing is it's using one uh, ESP8266 to create an access point, And then it passes the information over serial to the second one, which then joins the access point every, I think it's like every 30 seconds or something. So what that does is if you're doing like a Wi-Fi hacking game, it lets you generate a handshake that you can easily change the password of if you want to like very consistently without doing any deauthing. And a lot of people get mad about deauthing because uh, it can cause a lot of disruptions. So Stefan and I have been dedicated to trying to make sure that there's tools out there for people to practice Wi-Fi hacking without getting in trouble. Now the ultimate game that we created, which is actually featured on the recent episode of Hack 5 uh, that was just released today. So if you like the Hack 5 channel, check it out. We uh, just released a new video on there today about Wi-Fi hacking, so it's kind of good timing. But the Chicken Man game, is the ultimate game that we all worked on together. Of course, named after Stefan. Um, this is a game that allows you to hack access points, get points, uh, and actually keep track of who's winning with a LED strip that like kind of like uh, keeps track of who's winning the game. And this is an example of when we actually played it with a bunch of people. Uh, it was really, really cool. Again, this is for another presentation, but it was a very, very cool game. And also you get this chicken banner that is seriously not messing around. Um, so this was an awesome project in getting access point, uh, well, basically making um, safe tools for people to practice on that will not get them in trouble. You can, you know, de-auth um, all you want in the chicken man game. It is not uh, going to cause any problems, but also it's not necessary because all of this is set up to generate handshakes so that you're at a school. Um, if you're doing this as a like in a hacker space, you're not potentially accidentally deauthing the wrong network and getting in trouble. Okay, that's it for my screen. So hopefully in 2021, you guys will also have some um, reactive hacking tools to play with, so that when you hack something. You know, you'll be able to like uh, see it light up when you hack it successfully and play games with other hackers and sharpen your hacking schools without getting arrested or accidentally like disconnecting your neighbor's insulin pump. Cool. All right. Well, I think that is mostly it. Um, unless you guys have any more questions, I will refer you guys to the links that we mentioned before. I'll type them right now. Hack.gay will go ahead and take you to other content that I've produced, including a full version of this class. And if you want to check out other stuff that we've done, um, yeah, make sure to follow me on Twitter. 
Uh, and yeah, thank you. I think that my chat also might be broken because I'm not seeing my own chat update. But either way. Yeah, that, that's the issue I had. Yeah, uh, we appreciate everyone being here today, uh, watching with us and otherwise giving us feedback. So yeah, thank you to James for uh, at the last moment jumping in and presenting his tool that he contributed to this project. Thank you to everybody who's on the chat now watching with us and uh, participating in the community. And again, we do this so that we can meet other people. If you have ideas for this project, if you want to jump in preferably and uh, contribute to this project, or if you just want to keep in touch with us, then you can do so on Twitter. And uh, we were very, very happy to get to uh, present to you guys today. So thank you. I hope you have a great rest of your C remote C3 conference, and hopefully we will see you in person next year. Bye. Bye.